second Sunday of Easter. Welcome also to River Mike Revner, who's with us this morning, and uh, will be coming to speak to us just a little bit later in this service. You received the announcement sheet as you came in, and if not, you might have seen some of the announcements on the screen. <coughs> Reminder also of the ham cake of the summer coming up. And some more sad news this morning. I received an email earlier this morning from Shirley Gorley. Her husband Bill passed away early this morning. Funeral arrangements are incomplete at this time, but uh, we will let you know when those arrangements are made. So we express our sympathy to Shirley and the boys uh, in their sudden loss. of the light that shines forth from the empty tomb, a light that God has placed deep within our hearts, and a light that dwells within each of us. May the lighting of this candle be a reflection of God's true light. And we acknowledge our place here. We acknowledge the difficult relationship that has often existed between ourselves and our First Nations people. But we celebrate those occasions when we can acknowledge one another on this unceded and territorial land of the Alaskan people, and we continue to work for right relationships. Our invitation to worship. We are called to rejoice <coughs> and to proclaim the good news. For we are at peace with people. We come together as people limited by time and space. But free to be born anew to the greater and wider life in the one who is the master of time and space. Let us worship God in whom we live and move and have our being. Let us pray. O oh God, we thank you for the risen Christ and for the promise of new eternal life in him. You scatter the clouds of death and despair so that our eyes may behold the wonders of your love. We await the fresh signs of your abiding presence and care as we worship you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. And our hymn, Hallelujah, Hallelujah, give thanks to the risen Lord. <clears throat> <clears throat>
Will you join with me now in our prayer of confession? Most gracious and caring God, we turn to you, believing in your love and uplifting compassion. We acknowledge before you and one another that our thoughts, actions, and words have betrayed the trust and commitment that you have bestowed upon us. Free us from our burden of guilt and guide us in the way of faithfulness. We ask this in the name of the risen Christ. Amen. As the sun melts the ice in springtime and blossoms begin to burst forth from dry branches, so God's warmth can heal and transform the darkness and brokenness within us. We can begin anew, recreated in God's love. Thanks be to God. And as a people of faith, we share together in the new creed. I invite you to stand. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to the church to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to see justice and justice evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. And you might want to remain standing for our next hymn, Come and Find the Quiet Center. Now when they had brought them 
They set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did we strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood on us. Then Peter and the other apostle answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are also his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. And then from the 20th chapter of John, one of the resurrection experiences, beginning at the 19th verse. Then that same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Now when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Then Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. <coughs> if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, <coughs> Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here, and look at my hands. Reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Thanks be to God for this Easter story of the resurrection. <clears throat> and the choir under Heather's leadership are picking this same theme up in their selection when Thomas first heard, first the tidings heard.
leading the service next Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> the whole service will be led by <coughs> and the choir. And then uh, two weeks from today is uh, Mother's Day and Christian Family Sunday. And what better way to celebrate that than to baptize two little children Aww. and to bring them into the family of God. And then the UCW are not off the hook because they're ending the service the Sunday after that. So the next three Sundays are set in stone. <laughs> Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Well, I've never seen Mike before, but I heard about him and I believed. I also know that there are two members of this congregation they're on Mike's chaplaincy committee, Tom and Bob. And uh, so Mike is here this morning to speak on behalf of the campus ministry. And not only that, he's going to share some scripture, and he's going to sing, and he's going to speak to us. Welcome, Mike. things that just don't seem to make sense. Uh, why do bad things happen uh, to good people? A friend of mine whose father was, has just recovered from a heart attack uh, said to my wife just the other day, when does it ever get easy? And there's that sense, isn't it? You know, life goes on and, and it seems like we get sort of going along and boom, something throws a monkey wrench or we hit a pothole. It's like, oh, things get tough again. And uh, I'm always reminded of, of the fact that uh, just as we've been singing and talking about God uh, rose Jesus from the grave, there's nothing he can't do, and he does watch over us. And so here's a couple of uh, gospel songs. It's okay to do gospel songs, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, children, by and by, oh, when the morning comes, all the same. Of God gathering on, we will tell the story of how we overcome, and we'll understand it better by and by. Trials dark on every hand, and we cannot understand. Always that God may lead us to the blessed and promised land. He will guide us with his eye, and we'll follow to his guide, and we'll understand it better by and by. By and by, oh, when the All the saints of God are gathering all the we will tell the story of how we hope to come, and we'll understand it better by and by. Temptations hit the stairs, often catch us somewhere, and our hearts are made to believe for some 
not this word of me. And I wonder why the test when we try to do our best. But we'll understand it better by and by. Well, children, by and by, we'll learn to know we come. All the strains of God gathering on.
had brought me back uh, to uh, my days when I was in seminary at Acadia Divinity College and I was the youth pastor at a Baptist church. So uh, I don't know if you like that uh, comparison, but you have a very kind of Baptist feel about <laughs> your service. So there, there you go. Yes. It sort of reminds me of a little story about the Catholic and the Baptist kids. They were uh, they were best friends, and then and, and they tried to get each other to go to each other's church. And, and the Baptist kid said to the Catholic kid, well, look, I'll make you a deal. If, if I go to your church, you, you'll come to mine one Sunday. And so that was the deal the kids made. So the Baptist kid goes to the Catholic church service. And, of course, the priest walks in. And people are making these different uh, signs. And they're, they're kneeling. And they're getting up. And they're doing all of these things. And every time something would happen in, in, the, in the service, the Baptist kid would, would poke his friend and say, well, what's going on? What's the priest doing? And say, oh, well... The priest is, he's, 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 uh, do, he's blessing this. And, okay, well, what's he doing now? Well, he, they're doing this now. They're getting ready to read the scripture. And, and why are they standing? Well, they're getting ready for this. And why are they kneeling? Because, they, you know, it's so foreign to the Baptist kid. They didn't have kneeling benches and things like that. So he's asking all these questions and, and so forth. And the Catholic kid was explaining everything. Why are people going forward and kneeling down in front of the priest? And, well, that's communion all that. So the Sunday came for the Catholic kid. <laughs> to go to the Baptist service. And the same kind of thing happened. You know, the people uh, stood up when, when the choir came in and so forth. Well, what's going on with the choir? That's the sign. The, the service is starting. And why are people standing up? Well, it's time to take up the offering. And so, and so the explanations went back and forth. And then uh, the preacher, was his, the Baptist preacher got up to speak. And he did this thing that, that Baptist preachers uh, used to do. They don't do it anymore because there's clocks on the wall, but the Baptist preacher stood up and he opened his Bible and he took off his watch like this and he laid it down on the pulpit like this and the Catholic kid nudged his friend and he said, what does that mean? And the Baptist kid said, absolutely nothing. <laughs> I was telling uh, Tom and Bob how uh, I was speaking at Marysville United. I've been going along there for a few years uh, and uh, supply preaching. And, and uh, they, they pulled me aside one Sunday and said, Sir, sermons are only 11 minutes long. <laughs> True story. So I had my iPod and uh, I had a timer set on for 11 minutes. Maybe I should do that. <laughs> oh, seven minutes. Oh, seven Okay. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll do seven and a half when the sermon starts. So 11 minutes, I said it, and I was preaching. And, and I don't know, Baptist preachers, sometimes we just feel, we feel this, uh, you know, spirit. We're just into the Word. And I was walking down the aisle, I was preaching without a microphone, and all of a sudden my iPod went, Wee! <laughs> And I said, do you hear that? And they go, what? And I, Wee! <laughs> So that's not the spirit. That's the time. That's the time. So seven and a half. I won't hear your voice. What's that? We don't hear your voice. The scripture this morning. I want to draw attention to just a couple short passages. And boy, I kind of wish I would have followed the lectionary. Those are great, uh, great passages of scripture this morning that were read. Uh, but Matthew chapter uh, 28, this being sort of a focus on campus ministry, I was thinking about the word disciple and how Jesus here in this scripture verse, beginning at verse 16, says, 11 disciples went away into Galilee, of course Judas was no longer with them, to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them, and when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, or if you break down the Greek, it's as you go, make disciples, make students, make followers of Jesus of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And then turning over to John chapter 13, just uh, four verses. 31 to 35, Jesus here is speaking to his disciples, and he says this in John chapter uh, 13, 
Uh, do you know what I have done to you? He's just washed their feet. You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. And most assuredly, I say to you uh, that a servant is no, not greater than his master, nor is he who sent greater than he who sent him. If you do these things, you will be blessed. A new commandment I give to you, this is in verse 34, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. So this morning I want to talk briefly <coughs> I went back to 2.30. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm going to talk to you briefly about making students, uh, followers of Jesus, disciples. And Jesus used this word, disciples. And, and if we go back in Jesus' time, a disciple was simply a student. Rabbis would gather uh, young men around them, and those young men were students. Uh, they became uh, students of, of the rabbi, of the teacher. And Jesus, as he is getting ready to leave this earth, gives this an authority to go as, people, as the disciples were to go, as people to go, and, and therefore make followers, make students of Jesus. Sometimes in the church we look at this word discipleship and we translate it to mean that we have to go and get people saved. We have to go out and, 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 and proclaim this gospel, lead them in perhaps the... the uh, in the olden days, I call it the olden days, lead them on the Romans' road to salvation or, or share with them God's plan for forgiveness and, and so forth so that they become Christians. And we view that as, as making disciples. But I think Jesus meant way more than that. He said, go therefore and make followers, make learners, make seekers, ones that want to learn more about who I am. And then baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And he says, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And so then, for me, as I read that passage, I say, well, what did Jesus command us to do? And as we read in John 13 and in, uh, in verse, those uh, first verses and then in verse 34, he said, he said simply this, read it again. Love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. That's the command. That's all it is. It's not all of these rules and regulations. It's, it's, it's not these things that we find in the Old Testament that Moses brought down written on tablets of stone. And the prophets talked about the fact that there was a day coming when there would be a new temple and God would write his law on people's hearts. And that law is a law of love. Jesus simply put it this way. If we are to go and make followers or students of Jesus, we just need to love them. And that's what we get to do on campus. Your church supports campus ministry. Your church uh, is one of, of, of a few churches in this city that financially contribute to campus ministry, but also by uh, having these great men as resources who help us keep ourselves organized and find vision. And our mandate is simply to love to love the 10,000 students coming from 100 different countries. We're to love them. That's it. We don't need to judge them. We don't have to try to uh, proselytize them. Our command is simply love them. And Jesus said this. It's not the great programs that you might invent. It's not... The, the great ideas that you come as trying to figure out how to reach, 
out to the, one, the 10,000 students. It's simply this, that you love them. By this, all will know that you are my students if you have love for one another. It's, in one way, the simplest thing. But on the other hand, I don't know about you, and this is where I'd be, I get to be vulnerable, is loving one another sometimes is one of the most difficult things to do. If we're honest, to love someone takes time. It takes investment of who we are. It takes transparency. I've been doing an experiment on campus, and it's a simple little experiment. But what I do is when I walk through campus, I take note of who might look up and say hi. Now, I thought of myself a couple of weeks of walking on campus and walking like this. And here's what I meant 99% of the time. Mm -hmm. And so I started doing this. And so I go, hi, and they go, hi. <laughs> it's a little act of love saying hi. It's so hard. I gotta admit, when someone walks past you like this, they are giving you the signal, do not, yeah. do not yes. communicate. And so when you take that little extra step, hi. Mm -hmm. And I've had people now go, hi they start to engage with at least a glance and at least a look. I met with Nancy O'Shea before Christmas and they were looking for coats and mittens for international students. And I said, you know, and I was able to find some winter coats and, and some boots and things for international students. Uh, and we, I was able to drop them off at the, at the C.C. Jones Student Services Center. And she goes, well, you know, that's really not our biggest need for international students. And I was expecting to hear that what is needed is, is homes for them to visit at Christmas time, for people to connect with. But you know what Nancy told me that the biggest need is of international students? Is to have a friend on campus. To have a student who would say, come and eat lunch with me, or can I sit beside you? That when an international student, when they first arrive into this country, they find themselves very lonely. And it's, it doesn't shock me at all, because... On the campus, there is that go to class and do your thing. And it's hard. And she said the hardest thing to do is for students to connect with one another. Well, why is it hard? Why is it hard to love one another? Well, love in the Greek and in English is two things. It's a noun, so it's something that it is, but it's also a verb. It's an action. And so I always believe that I can't give what I don't have. So in order for me to love, I have to have love. And Jesus said that. I give to you that you love one another. Verb. Action. That there are demonstrative things that we can do to show our love for one another. Saying hi. Hi. Come and sit beside me. Would you like to go for a coffee? Um, and also those actions of being able to give uh, clothing or to be able to provide a meal. Those are different and, and action things that we can do. But we can't do it unless we have it. And so how do we get this love? Well, in the scripture that was read uh, this morning by Reverend DeLong, we noticed that Jesus breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Jesus put it this way when he was talking to Nicodemus. You must be born again. Great Baptist praise, be born again. What does that mean? When Jesus was resurrected from the grave, and later ascended into heaven, and then released His Holy Spirit upon the believers. They became a new creation, the Bible says. 
That anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. Anyone who is in Christ has been born again. They have a new nature. They've received the Spirit of God within. And it's that Spirit of God within us that gives us and transforms us so that we have this nature of love. The Apostle John wrote in his book, 1 John 4.16, that God is love. So in order for us to be able to give love, we have to get it. And the kind of love that Jesus here is talking about in John chapter 13 is the sort is the kind of love that he gave to us. He says, "Love one another as I have loved you." It's a love which isn't judgmental. And so on campus, we don't judge I don't care what religion you are. I don't care what church you go to or you don't go to. I don't care your gender, your sexuality. That doesn't mean anything to me. What's more important to me is, am I loving? And your church has demonstrated love for those 10,000 students by being involved with campus ministry. My heart breaks when I meet with pastors of churches in our city, and I invite them to get involved with us, with campus ministry, by coming and loving our campus, by contributing financially, by getting some of your church members to perhaps take part in our council meetings. And sadly, a number of churches, they they can't because of this, the wide open door, it doesn't make sense to me, the wide open door that we have to just simply love, not to judge, not to promote my particular denominational core values, but to just love. Because Jesus said, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you go to the Baptist Church, the Pentecostal Church, the Wesleyan Church, the Anglican Church, the United Church, the Lutheran Church, the Reformed Church, the Interdenominational Church, the Charismatic Church, the Presbyterian Church. No! <laughs> By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And your church, thank God, for churches like Nashwalk's United Church, who said, we will not put any conditions on how we love 10,000 students at UNB. And as a congregation, my closing words, I know I'm over seven. <laughs> my closing words to your congregation is this whole city will know that you are his disciples if you have love. Oh, I find it hard to love. Where do I start? God, breathe this love into my life. Help me to simply smile and say hi to someone on the street Give me the strength and courage to say hi to my next door neighbor who perhaps I've never met after all of these years. Give me the strength and courage to not have any other agenda but to simply love. On behalf of the, uh, the Council for Christian Ministry here on campus at UNB, I want to say thank you Thank you for loving you and me unconditionally. By this, they will know that we are his disciples. Let's pray. God, grant us by your Holy Spirit the strength, the grace the power to simply love. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Um, I do have another song for you, if that's all right. Yes. <laughs> I, this has been my theme song for different churches this last little while. Thank you, Mike. I have seen and I still believe. <laughs> 
What a point of contention, Mike. <laughs> I have to confess. I once went to another university and graduated from there, and we had a love-hate relationship with you and me. Oh. <laughs> we used to steal each other's goalposts. <laughs> <laughs> and I rejoiced when Mount A came to the UNB campus and came back with shouts of victory. <laughs> and then UNB came to Mount A and did the same thing. But I think inside we love one another. We must have, because both my son and my daughter graduated from UNB, one here and one in St. John. And I went to Dal. It's a hard choice when I go to hockey games sometimes. And, and I heard you make reference to Acadia. I went to Acadia. Oh, my. Oh. <laughs> How we all love one another, though, as students, <laughs> as learners. Some of you, when you came in, did place an envelope in the plate for campus ministry, and if you've not done so, that's not the end of the matter. You can take the envelope home, you can fill it out, put something in it, and bring it back to the office. And it will go to the work of campus ministry. <clears throat> every good and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from God, the creator of the heavenly lights, who does not change or cause darkness by turning. By our offering today and our continuing offering for the work in the world, may light grow and may love grow. Let us pray as we dedicate that offering together. May new life arise from these gifts, O God, for the suffering, a new hope of healing, for the downcast, a new hope of happiness, for the struggling, a new and confident hope of peace, new life in the risen Christ. Amen. Most Sundays there are opportunities to celebrate a number of different things. And this past Friday was also Earth Day. And I came across the most beautiful prayer about Earth Day. And I want to lead you and share with you in that prayer this morning. Written by a fellow, uh, a colleague in the United Church from Georgetown, Ontario. This beautiful Earth Day prayer. Let us pray. <coughs> O oh, creating God, you give us the thunder of the sky and the summit of the mountain to experience. You give us the beauty of the trees and the softness and stillness of the air to breathe. You give us the fragrance of the earth to smell and the roar of the sea to embrace. You give us rain, snow, and the cold to feel against our skin. We are all born part of this earth. You give us morning and the night, a new day, a fresh day today, ready to be opened. You teach us to never take from your creation more than we can give. You teach us to never take from the earth what we cannot use. You remind us, no matter the length of the to-do list, to dive into the unknown and to release the grip of our tight schedules that hold us down. We are reminded that as part of God's creation, we must rest, rest from our labors and rest from our consumption. We thank you, creating God, for the trust you have in us, to be partners with you in mending and tending to creation. May the awe and sense of your wonder fill our hearts each and every day. O oh God, we thank you today for students throughout our various campuses, not only in this province, but throughout the world those who come to learn, that they may go out and share and teach. We thank you for those around us, family and friends. And today we grieve with some. We support others who are dealing with illness, 
or discouragement or depression. Loss of their normal way of life. We pray for those who are struggling with decisions that need to be made. <coughs> and in all of this, O oh God, may all of our thoughts and words and actions be rooted and grounded in the love that you have taught to us and shown to us through the gift of your Son. He has given us a prayer, one that we can share together, and we do so now as we pray Jesus' prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. <coughs> Conclusion of the service, uh, Mike and I will walk up together, and you may want to spend a moment to, to share something with Mike or, or tell him something, and he might want to share something with you. Mm -hmm. So take advantage of that opportunity that we have today. And always greet one another with the words that God has given, for God so loved the world. And we are people that want to follow those words. Our benediction, son benediction today, I'm going to live so God can use me. May that be in our hearts, not only as we sing it, but this afternoon, maybe as you're laying down to go to bed tonight, may the words keep ringing in your head and in the days to come.